Welcome everyone to Birding by Ear. I am Rich Chambers. The presentation is hosted by the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science. So remember to open your chat window if you haven't yet. And you do that by going to the bottom of your screen and you'll see a little menu pop up and just click on chat. You can send me questions or comments there. And I'll try to look at them as best I can. But the uh, chat window is pretty busy typically. If you want to ask a question, it might help if you type it in all caps. Then it would stand out and I'd be more likely to see it. So we did have a question from last week. And uh, the question was asked about the fussy sound that one of the Vireo made. And uh, what does that mean? Well, my best not really an answer is that I attended an American Birding Association presentation on spectrograms and a black capped chickadee made the sounds chickadee dee. You've all heard that, I'm sure. It also made the sound chickadee dee dee, chickadee dee 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 and chick a d d d d d five d's so the theory presented during that presentation was that the more d's uh, meant danger so i guess if you have five d's that's a lot of danger however i would say so far we humans have not developed much of an understanding of why another species does anything so the chickadee is a good example of a bird that doesn't always make all the sounds we hear on the recording. What you hear in the field is a portion of what we hear in the recording. And then maybe later it'll sing another portion of that bit. So you have to be aware of that, that once you, know, once you get the sounds really well known from a recording, then you might not, ex you shouldn't expect to hear the entire sound in the field all the time. So in the Tahoe region, we call the, we call the, uh, the mountain chickadee the cheeseburger bird. So there was a smart remark from last week. Someone, an ex-friend, suggested that since I am old enough, the pterodactyl picture from last week must have been taken by me. Well, I would like to say in my defense that cameras were not yet invented. So let's go on to the homework. See if you can identify these. Type it into your chat window. Lots of good guesses. Well, in some cases, not guesses. And you hear all these kind of separate sounds that the this is the American Robin makes. And again, you, you won't hear all of them all the time in the field, but you do hear some of them quite often, some little piece of this recording. All right, I think there were two recordings playing at once there for a second. So some people guessed Robin, a lot of people, and a couple of people guessed Tanager, easily, easily confused. So let's play the Tanager right now. Let's see if I can figure out which one it is. I think it's this one. Yep. Now that chibidit that you're hearing is a great way to figure out it's a Western tanager. And you hear that call a lot in the field. So I've 
found a whole lot more Western tanagers now that I know to look for them when I hear that tribidate sound. Now that does sound a bit like a robin, doesn't it? So that's why I wanted you to practice with these three birds. We'll get to the other one in a minute. Oops. All right, so let's play the second one, see what you think it is. Okay, everybody got that one right. That was the Stellar Shay. How about this one? Okay, that is the red-breasted nuthatch. Good work, everybody. Now this one is the tanager. Let's play it again. the Western Tanager. How about this one? Yeah, everybody knows this one. Mountain Chickadee. But you notice there are a lot of different little pieces and parts to the song. And uh, he's not going to sing them all, all the time. You just kind of have to know, oh, I heard a piece of the song, and that, that must be the chickadee. And the last one. Very whistly. Okay, good. A lot of, a lot of good uh, IDs. Almost everybody has it right. The black-headed grosbeak. So if you're still having trouble with any of those, continue to work on them. It's a really great way to get started. So let's identify our first group. Tim's got it right. Those are the wrens. So what I've what I've come up, up with as a helpful hint would be tends to be a whistled song, but they're kind of frenetic, almost ADD, with many often jumbled notes. So to me, if it's just a big jumble, it's very likely it's a wren. Not all wrens are jumbles, but uh, many of them are. So some of them are melodious, others are harsh or squeaky, most are high pitched. Let's listen to a series of wrens.
All right. And that was the rock wren, the house wren, the Pacific wren, the marsh wren, and the canyon wren. Let's look at some, some uh, examples of each. I had a question from uh, Mary and Bill, or oops, sorry, Susan, where do the wrens live? Well, it depends on the exact species. The rock wren, you're going to find them around rocks. I mean, it's a great name for this bird, unlike many other bird names that are completely loopy. So you see this guy sitting on rocks a lot. Now, did you hear my description in all of that? Kind of slightly buzzy whistled, a lot of neener neeners and zooey zooey. And it can be confused with a mockingbird because it repeats a lot. That was a mockingbird. So let's hear them again. David wanted to know, do they repeat five times? I think that's a good observation, but I don't know that you can count on it, on that. Let's take a guess at the next round. Now that sounds like a jumble to me. Yep, Mary and Bill have it right, that's a house wren. had some good comments here. So one was, was for the last slide, was I don't associate mockingbird habitat with rock wren. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, I think it would be unusual usual to see them both in the same habitat. It's very true. Somebody says, why is it called a, a house wren? I think because, and I've seen this happen, I see them around housing a lot. We used to have these nests in a little pot in our house in, uh, um, in Menlo Park. So do you get that it is a jumble and it's rapid, kind of rapid chattering calls? That's what, does it sound like that to you? So 
Sounds like it kind of cascades down in, in pitch a little bit. All right, let's play a little bit of it again. Diane says a scolding tone. Kristen noted that they have rock wrens and mockingbirds in her Northwest Reno neighborhood. So you can never be too sure, but location is a really great clue as to what bird it is. What's the next wren? Kind of a jumble too, isn't it? The pace is faster than the house wren. So uh, Rachel got it right, Pacific Wren on that last guess. Um, I think it is higher pitched. It doesn't seem to descend that much like the house wren did. So it's just really frenetic. This is a very nervous bird. I remember trying to see it once in a thicket with a, I had a fellow with me that was a real expert in birding and he saw it. He's trying to get me to see it and it just took I don't know, five or 10 minutes for me to see this bird. It's really dancing around in the background. So let's listen to a little bit of it again, the Pacific Wren. What's the next wren? Okay, Rachel has it right, Marsh Wren. So to me, this is a very mechanical sounding bird. I don't have mechanical written down here, but it sounds a bit mechanical to me, like it's a piece of machinery almost. It's a kind of liquid, squeaky, rattling trill. And these are easy to hear in the marsh uh, where, where there's reeds, yeah, of course, during breeding season. Very easy to hear. A lot easier to hear than see, in fact. Bonnie suggested uh, a little bit like a machine gun. Yep. So Liz says her siblings old. What was the Pacific Rim before it was? Before it was that. I believe it was the Winter Rim, but don't quote me on that. I think that's what what it was. Let's listen to the Marsh Rim just a little bit more. These are really fun. I go to the uh, 
Yolo Bypass Preserve a lot because it's between uh, Lake Tahoe and San Francisco. And I traveled between the two quite a bit. And there were so many of them down in there. And you only saw one. But I know I must have heard at least 20. So the Marsh Wren. What do you think this next one is? That's just a great song, and it's just unmistakable to me. Canyon Wren, yes. Do you catch that? It's a long series of descending notes, a little slower at the end. These are great birds because uh, it's sitting on a rock, so hey, it must be a rock wren. No, it's not. It's kind of orange. That's a big giveaway when you see this guy. It's pretty, uh, pretty easy to see once you hear it, and they don't tend to move around much, at least not, not the day I was seeing this particular one. Let's listen to a little bit more of it. Okay, that's really one of the great ones, I think. One of my favorites. Okay, next wren. All right. Someone guessed the cactus wren. Uh, we don't have those in the Tahoe area, so we wouldn't, that wouldn't be yet. Um, a Pacific Wren, no. It's a Buick's Wren. So one thing I'm noticing is there's a little bit of a trill at the end of some of, some of the phrases, not always. Somewhat of a slow trill. Let's see if we can find that. That's the trill right at the end there. For some reason, I always have a lot of trouble with this one. Um, it doesn't always sing the same set of phrases. Uh, 
And it almost sounds like it might be something other than Iran to me sometimes. So who was Buick? Well, he was a friend of um, John James Audubon. It's really good to be a friend of Audubon if you want a bird named after you, as it turns out. And so he named this bird. The Audubon first described it, and then he named it after a friend who's an English engraver and a natural historian. All right, we're moving on to another group. So what group do you think this, these birds might belong to? Okay, we got guesses all over the place here. Warbler, uh, sparrow, kinglet. Bonnie says kinglet. Yes, it's, I've grouped some birds together and called it kind of this group of kinglets and a waxwing. And why? Because they're really high pitched. They might end in kind of a fussy chatter or whistle. So let's listen to the group of them. It'll be the ruby crown, the go golden crown, kinglets, followed by the cedar wax wing. Now these are really high pitched. And if you're not hearing them from your speakers, it's just like uh, I found one, one test laptop that I tried that could not reproduce. Uh, it couldn't reproduce the high pitches at all. It just sounded like a clank kind of. So it could be you'll need a different PC or something or a set of uh, earphones would probably do it. Okay, let's look for the first, the first kinglet as it turns out. That's right, it's the ruby crowned. And you really can hear these high pitches in the fields if you're close enough to the bird. And to me, I hear a high pitch followed by kind of a moderate tone songish thing. All right, I know you've seen kinglets, and there's certainly a lot of them around the Tahoe region. And it's one of those birds that has a name that you think, well, why'd they call it that? Okay, it does have a ruby crown, but you don't see it much. You can just barely see it in this picture. But when the light catches it, you can really see it quite well. What's next? Okay, Bonnie's got it right. This is the golden crown kinglet. Okay, 
And it seems like there's more high pitch stuff going on here with this gimlet. And they uh, tend to be high in the trees. And uh, it's really helpful to hear that high pitched tone to know that you've got what you've got and, and, and you know what you're looking for and kind of where it is. So I find it confusing. Uh, the brown creeper and this bird confuse me. Don't they sound very similar? Let's play the creeper again. We'll go over the creeper in a bit. So there is a way to tell the difference, but it's not, it's not easily done from, uh, well, it can be done by the song, but you have to listen to a, a bit of it. If they don't sing much, then it's hard to tell the difference. So what's next? Okay, Bambi's got that right. It's the cedar waxwing. So I don't know if you call that a song exactly. But that's all they do, this high-pitched and repeated z z z, And uh, I've heard it when they fly overhead a lot. They seem to use it when they're flying and not so much when they're sitting in the tree. So keep that in mind. If you hear that high-pitched sound, look up. You're liable to see a flock of them. They do tend to flock together a lot, so there'll be a bunch of them together. Cedar waxwing. Moving on to another group. What do you think it is? Okay, we got a lot of uh, thrush guesses. That's correct. Thrasher. Uh, Vireo. Yes, yeah, the, these are the thrushes. Some of the best singers there are. So they are wonderful singers. And they often have a spiral sound somewhere in their song. Let's listen to just the spiral part. See what I mean by a spiral? All right, let's listen to the group of thrushes. So that was the hermit thrush, the American robin, the buried thrush, and the Swainson's thrush. Which one was this? Yep, Bonnie's got it right. That's the hermit.
All right, for this one, I can always tell it from the others because of this first note that they sing. It's kind of a extended note and they'll sing it on a particular tone and then do some other flute-like pitch noises. And then they'll come out with another first note, but it won't be on the same pitch as the prior one. Let's listen to that. Oops, technical failure here. Hang on a second. Okay, you heard two, two phrases. First one started with kind of a lower extended tone and then some singing and then the next one starts a little bit higher tone let's see if i can get it back to there yeah well i had it backwards so it started out the first one was a higher pitch some notes and then a lower pitch and some notes very important for figuring this bird out. Okay, the hermit thrush. So we had a comment here from Tim. I hear it all the time, but not quite sure how high off the ground. Hmm. Well, uh, every time I've seen it, Tim, it's been about 10 feet up in the tree. Now, I don't know if that's a good clue or not, but that's what I've noted. What do you think this next thrush is? Okay, not too hard, one of your home, homework birds. Now it is a thrush and it does have uh, that spiral sound in there, if you listen for it. Some way to tell it's a robin because you hear some of the other sounds, you think it's a robin, then you hear that spiral and you're, sh you're sure. Right there. The squeak, the squeaky sound is pretty uh, characteristic. So Robin's made a lot of different sounds, but they're pretty distinct. Sounds like I almost mixed in a few other birds into that one. I'll have to check that later. So for sure at the beginning, it's a robin. Okay. Now these are hard to tell apart from a black-headed grosbeak and a western tanager especially when you're first starting with bird sounds. Let's listen a little bit to the gross beak. Very whistly, much more so than the robin. Tanager.
The sound is a little bit slurry. Some people call it burry. And it has that trividit that you always know that's a tanager. Let's listen to the robin a little bit more. Now that's the part of the robin song that can be confused with the gross beak. Again, a very whistly sound. And the tanager is a bit burry or slurry. Sl Oops, tricked again. Here we go. All right, moving on to another group. Any guesses? Some people think it's warblers. Okay, that is correct. Moving on to the real super singers, the warblers. So I found that some warblers sound pretty similar but there are subtle differences if you listen to them enough. It's gonna take practice with some of these warblers. Very often the song is going to start with a up, down, up, down, seesaw, seesaw, and kind of a whistle at the end, with maybe an up or down note or trill after the seesaw. So let's see what I mean by seesaw. You hear that? That's if you hear that sound, it's probably a warbler. Okay, let's listen to the group of warblers. Okay, that was the orange crowned, Nashville, yellow, yellow rumped, hermit, Magilla Rays, and Wilson's Warbler. So let's move on to the first one. I bet you've heard this. They're, mm, I wouldn't call them common, but fairly easy to see in the basin. All right, what's that sound like? It's got a, ooh, it's got kind of a, hmm. Well, it's a bit of a trill, but it tends to slow down a little bit at the end, and it also goes down in pitch. Oops, well, here we go. Runs out of steam, Diane said. Yeah, it does sound kind of like that, doesn't it? Oh, sorry. Moving back, here we go. The orange crown. Yeah, running out of steam downhill. Now, does this sound like a junko? I'm going to maintain yes, because I was fooled once and embarrassed, of course, in the field when I said that a uh, Junko was an orange crown warbler. So let's listen and see if we can see what the similarities are. Okay, similar. It's kind of a rapid set of notes, a trill, but it doesn't go down in tone, does it? Let's listen to this guy again, the orange crown.
See it trailing off? So it's a Junko, but no. If it's not a Junko, but it sounds like a Junko, then it's an orange crown warbler. So what's next? This is a good one, and you hear these guys a fair amount. I had one in my backyard this year. I don't see any guesses. This is this is a tough one. Okay. Nashville, Mary and Bill, good work. Okay, that's a, that's fairly distinctive, but I have a little trouble with it and a couple of other ones that we'll get to. All right, so this is another of those birds whose name makes absolutely no sense, but I hope they don't change it. It really messes me up when they change the bird's name. So, Turns out Robert Ridgway first saw the Western version of this bird and he called it the Calaveras warbler. That was in 1868. Well, the Nashville warbler and the Calaveras warbler are the same species, but this bird doesn't ever breed in near Nashville, but it was first observed there in 1811 by a fellow called Alexander Wilson. Now you've heard that Wilson name before. We'll get to him in a bit. So let's listen a bit to this little bit mechanical seesaw followed by lower pitch notes. Um, Diane mentioned something that's very useful, I think, is it sounds like it's got two parts to it. It's kind of the seesaw and a little bit of a pause and then some other notes. So it's a two-part deal. That, that could be helpful in the field. Okay. What's next? Does it sound a little bit like the Nashville? All right. I got yellow from Lois. That is correct. Could you pick up some of that sweet, sweet, sweeter than sweet phrase? And plus it seemed to have three tones some of the times. There'd be a higher tone, then a middle tone, then a lower tone.
and we'll start from the beginning and see if you can can hear that common seesaw kind of song um, tones going on that point you to a warbler. Right there in particular. Okay, pretty, uh, pretty available in the region. Um, and I think their song is distinctive. Now, it might not sound that way yet, but it will as you learn more of the warblers. This one will become one that's distinctive enough to be readily identified. What's next? Very common, very common bird. Sometimes you go out in the fall, you'd swear that's the only bird that's out there. Yep, the yellow rim. good clue for this guy is it's slurry. Not all the other birds had slurred notes. This one sounds slurry to me. Well, not that. So I call that a fit sound. Fit, fit. Interestingly, uh, in Southern California, they don't say fit, they say fit. Okay, let's listen for the slurry sound a little while, while we're still here. Get that? A little bit slurry. So we're gonna have to stop, we're almost out of town, uh, time. So what do you think? Uh, we'll start with this bird next. Well, should be pretty easy to guess. Okay, we'll start there next time. So I'm going to put up the pole. If you could fill that out, it's very helpful to us. Thank you for doing that. There are nine questions. You have to answer all nine before the submit button will become active. So while you're doing that, we had a question from Eric. The differences between the Myrtle and Audubon's race of the yellow rumped warbler. And if you don't know, um, the yellow rump was split into two species for a long time. They were called the Myrtle and the Audubon. And the, the difference is fairly easy to see when you see the bird. Uh, now, Eric wondered if there was a difference in the songs. Uh, honestly, I don't know. I'm going to look that up and I'll try to answer that for next time, Eric. Okay. So I plan to send a PDF of this, plan to send a PDF of this presentation in, uh, later today. And um, let's see, unfortunately in the PDF, the songs can't be embedded into the PDF. So it's kind of up to you to find the songs. And I really recommend Cornell's website, All About Birds. Very easy to look up each species and play the song as many times as you want. And they have 
um, more than one bird. And so it's always useful to listen to multiple birds of the species because they're not all exactly alike. So if you have any other questions or comments, you can send them to my email, rich.chambers at gmail.com. And we'll pick up with the hermit warbler next time. So there will be some homework and that'll be in the email that'll be coming out a little bit later. Steve wonders if I could send the PowerPoint. I'm afraid I can't, Steve. Uh, that's something between me and uh, Tao Institute. Someone said, Lois says that Lake Tahoe CD by Moore is great. It's, very, it's an excellent one, I admit. Uh, yes. So what are the gliding birds I see in Tahoe in the early morning? They are eating bugs. Well, I'm guessing you don't see these birds land much. So if they're small, they could be swallows, probably. And if they're not small, but they're more hawk-sized, then they're some kind of night hawk. Can't scroll down to complete the poll. Well, I'll tell you, I don't like their, I don't like the way they did that much either, but there is a scroll bar all the way to the right-hand side. It's very hard to click on. Someone said, good pacing, like to have more time to listen to the songs. Yes, I did do that on purpose this time. Thank you for that. Huh. Does anyone have trouble with their Lake Tahoe CD uploading the MP3 files? Hmm, I haven't had any trouble at all. I always do what's called a burn thing with the software. I, I'm sorry, Eric, I don't have a CD for the Central Valley Birds. Uh, maybe the uh, Audubon Society there would have one. Uh, Rachel says she's having trouble getting the computer to recognize the CD as an audio CD. Ah, oh dear. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I have no idea on that. Okay, we're almost at one o'clock. And... So I'm gonna end the polling here, and then I'm gonna share it with you so you can see what, what other people said. Again, you have to scroll it down, which I find very irritating and difficult. Well, I'll look these over later. Thanks so much for joining. And we'll do this again next Thursday at noon. See you then. Bye.